Hey everyone, welcome to RCC at Home. My name's Natasha. If you've been hanging out with us here for a while and haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the little bell so that you're notified when new videos are released here. The best way for you to get connected with us here at RCC is to fill out a red card. And as always, you can find that link in the description box below. Coming up really soon is our child dedication service. If you have not already, be sure to uh, contact Pastor Erica and the way that you can do that, you know what, I'm just gonna make it really easy for you. Her email is gonna be in the description box down below. Right now we're gonna jump into our current series called Two Minute Warning and it's all about Jesus's playbook for when the end feels near. Check it out. Now to bring us to the two minute warning. Hey RCC family, welcome to RCC at Home. My name is Sam, I'm one of the pastors here and I, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm curious, are you into Marvel movies or TV shows? I, I tend to like them and, and if you do, I'm curious if you would uh, put or comment your favorite Marvel movie or TV show right now in the comments, I'd love to hear from you. If you don't watch them, this may surprise you and if you do, I'm wondering if you've noticed the same thing that I have. In the movies and especially the latest TV shows that they put out, they've been getting like really crazy deep, like mind-bending deep, philosophical and theologically deep. Have you noticed that? I was watching this one particular show called Loki the other day and, and the, the, the show is all about this godlike character that's a bit of a mischief maker. He's complex, he's a bad guy, and yet sometimes he, he does these good things. And, and just when you think he's changed for the better, like he's finally a better person, he, he double crosses somebody and, and then you think, oh, he's not a really good guy anymore either. Well, in one of the episodes, he said something that, uh, that really just struck me as really interesting and I couldn't get it out of my head. So, so this is what he said. He said, quote, I know something children don't know. No one bad is ever truly bad and no one good is ever really, truly good. Do you think that's true? Do you think that that's true? Are good people totally good and bad people completely bad? Or are we a mixture of the two things? I mean, it sure would make life a whole lot easier if, if we were just one or the other. Like if we were just really good or really bad and then life would be easy because you could just find the good people and stay away from the bad ones. It would be awesome if that were the case, but but I think we know, don't we? I mean, we know that what Loki said is true. How do we know? For starters, probably experience. But in addition to that, Jesus actually says so. There's this time that there's this religious leader that asked Jesus this question. He asks, good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Like, how much do I have to do? What's good enough? And Jesus responds by saying, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. So Jesus says, only God is truly good, which means none of us are truly, fully good. But there's something in that question, isn't there? We're often asking the same one that the religious leader is asking, like, what do we have to do to be good enough, don't we? I mean, best said, I think we're all asking, we're all wanting to be good enough. When I think of that, I think of maybe a young boy, uh, walking off the maybe flag football field. And his eyes are big. Maybe they're watering just a little bit. He just lost the game. He made a mistake that had cost the team the game. And, and his eyes are, are looking up at his dad. And they dart down to the ground. And they slowly like look back up at his dad again. And the eyes and the body language say more than words ever could, don't they? He's asking without saying a single word, Am I still okay, Dad? Do you still accept me? Am I still good enough for you? And if you think, by the way, that those are too big of questions for flag football, I'd invite you to start attending some youth sports events because those might actually be the only questions getting asked and answered at every one of those events. Flag football, maybe it's dance, maybe it's a report card at the end of the quarter, the yearly review at work, a chore you do for your family, or, or maybe just at the end of a really hard day walking through the doors of your home and, and, and you look at your spouse and, and you think, am I good enough? We live with this our 
our entire lives. Are we good enough? What do we have to do to be good enough? And that's what makes today's two-minute warning so dicey. I mean, I'm going to warn you, this may be one of the more uncomfortable sets of verses in all of the Bible, and, and we've saved it for our final two-minute warning. It's in Matthew chapter 25. It's a bit longer, but, but stick with me. See what it says. It says, and this is Jesus speaking, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, away with you, you cursed ones. Into the eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. And then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. If those verses don't make you feel at least a little uncomfortable, I'm not sure what will. I mean, why does it make us feel uncomfortable? I, I don't know about you, but, but for me, it brings up some questions. Which group am I in? Am I in or am I out? Will I be accepted? Am I, am I good enough? Have I done enough to earn it? Maybe you've asked some similar questions. We all want to be accepted, and it seems like Jesus is telling us how to be accepted. But at first glance, I'm not sure it squares with how we often talk about how to secure salvation and spend eternity with God. Don't you just, don't you just say a prayer, and, and that sends you to heaven when you die? And what's this about helping the least of these things all, all about? Oddly enough, this, this actually makes me think of, of this guy, uh, Mason Crosby. We had to squeeze at least a little bit of football into our two-minute warning series. But I don't know if you watched the game last week or not. If you didn't watch it, you might have heard it, heard about it because it was, it was crazy. I mean, five missed field goals in a row, two of them in overtime, three of them from Mason Crosby, who happens to be one of the most consistent and reliable kickers around. So, so imagine the moment, right? Five missed field goals between the two kickers, and there you are, you're Mason Crosby, set up to have to kick another 49-yarder. That's not a short kick. That's a long one. Just for a minute, I want you to imagine something. What if he missed it? What if he misses his fourth straight, and the Packers go on to lose the game? I mean, can you imagine the outrage from Packers fan if that were to happen? Get rid of the guy, right? He has one job. Just do your one job. I imagine there will be article after article and tweet after tweet saying he's past his prime. It's time to get rid of him. Send him on the road no matter how beloved of a guy he is. I mean, you can see the little boy walking off the flag football field. Except now he's all grown up. But the question question's still the same. Am I still enough? Am I still good enough for you? And the answer for a lot of people, if he had missed, would have been a resounding, no, you're not. And you know what? That's just life. That is his job. And at some point, he's going to not be able to hit those field goals and he'll have to retire and, and get let go. That's how the game works. And life isn't much different. Not every kid should get a trophy. It's reality, right? It gets you thinking. It gets you thinking. Is that how God works? 
Do we either perform and get into eternity with God, or do we not perform and get the boot? Let's go back to that warning from Jesus. There's something incredibly important in here that it's easy to just glance over. The people that Jesus invited in are just as surprised as the people who weren't invited in. They both ask, both groups ask, when did we see you? When did we see you hungry and feed you, naked and clothe you, thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you in prison and visit you? It's not like they knew some secret. It's not like they, they excuse me, it's not like they knew that how we treat the least of these is how they treat Jesus. At least that's not how Jesus describes it. I mean, if that were the case, I feel like they would have said, oh yeah, Jesus, I serve people in need every Tuesday. I thought that was you, Jesus. I thought that was you. It wasn't that. It was something different and more than that. They didn't have some secret knowledge. They had a heart change. They had a heart transformation. Like it says in Romans 12 too, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. This transformation is what Jesus is after. A kind of transformation that opens your eyes to the needs around you, that compels you to serve instead of being served. A, a kind of transformation that makes those kinds of actions almost second nature, like it's just what you do. Not to get something from it, but because it's who you were made to be. But this is hard for us to conceptualize because it gets muddled by a debate that's been going on for a couple thousand years, literally. I mean, when we think of eternity and going to heaven, we typically fall into one of two categories. We either think we're going there because of our faith, because of a prayer we said one day, or we think we're going there because of our actions or works. Either we believed enough and prayed seriously enough, or we did enough good for enough people. Faith versus works has been a debate in the church for generations. One of the most well-known verses on this subject literally comes from the Bible, from James. It was already there at the very beginning. Take a look, James 2, 14 through 17, it says this. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? I mean, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. You see, it's neither. It's not because you believed and prayed real hard. It's also not because you did enough good, because those good deeds have to come from a certain kind of place. It's something far more foundational than that. Remember, both groups Jesus talked to are surprised. Both groups ask, when did we see you? I mean, everybody and their brother wants to make this into a, a boxy check. Did I, did I say the magic words in a prayer that sent me to heaven? Check, prayed the prayer. Or did you do enough good for enough people? Check, did enough good. But that's not the picture Jesus is showing us here. Jesus is painting a picture of two different kinds of hearts. A heart that saw needs and couldn't help but meet them, and another heart that was cold to the needs around them. This is a heart question. It's, it's not a special prayer or a do enough question. It's a heart question question. Dallas Willard said it this way, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. You don't get to boast about how much you've done or accomplished in order to receive or earn God's kindness. We don't earn God's love. But you do get to have a changed and transformed mind and heart that can't help but be kind to and love others like Jesus has loved you. Here's what I need you to hear crystal clear. Maybe you're sitting there today and you're listening to this, you're watching this, and you're thinking, this goes against everything I know or believe. I was told I just needed to say a prayer. And hear me say this, that prayer is all you need. 
but not when you say it like it's a ticket you punched to get you in. It must be said as an acknowledgement that you need God. You need Jesus. You can't do this life without him. When you pray that prayer, that kind of prayer, in Philippians 1.6, it says this, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. When you pray that prayer and you invite God to begin that work, I have no doubt that you will enjoy eternity with Jesus in heaven. But it's more than punching a ticket. It's an invitation to heart and life transformation. There's more to this Mason Crosby story. As I was reading a few articles about it this week, I came across one of the, the Packers' websites that reported on an, art, an interaction that he had with one of his teammates. You see, after, after having missed three field goals that would have basically won the game, you might have imagined that the other players were either very frustrated with him or, or at best just really wanted to help him in any way that they could. And this is what that article reported happened. It said, quote, but after Crosby previously missed two tries at a potential game-winning field goal, plus a go-ahead kick late in the fourth quarter and a point after much earlier, Jones wanted to say something, anything, to let his kicker know he had his back. So before Crosby strolled out on the field to attempt a 49-yard field goal with two minutes left in overtime, Jones spoke from the heart, if ever so briefly. His teammate said to him this, I went up to him and just told him I loved him. That was it. Mason Crosby recalled it like this. He said, quote, He told me he loved me, gave me a little head nod, and went out there. Imagine that. Imagine that moment. And then if you watch the game, or if you want to watch it on YouTube, you walk out there, he walks out there, and he kicks the 49-yarder straight through the uprights. I don't know if it helped him make the kick or not. But I imagine it didn't hurt. I imagine it freed him just a bit. I imagine it reminded him just a little that, that while the field goal was important, whether he made it or not wasn't going to change how the important people in his life viewed him. Maybe that was just enough to free him to just go to work doing what he always did, a little less in his head about it. Same with God. Before we walk onto the field, before we head to work, before we eat breakfast, before we even open our eyes in the morning, God is saying, God is knocking at the door to tell us, I love you. Whether you succeed or fail today, I love you. Whether you do enough or don't do enough today, I love you. No matter what, this love through Jesus is here waiting for you. I love you no matter what. We can either accept that or not. We can allow that to transform us, putting us at ease, trusting God to work through us and go to work representing him in the way we live and act, or we can be cold to it. We can, we can keep it at arm's length. Think we have to do more to earn it and in turn never be transformed by it. We can even hear it a hundred thousand times in sermons on a Sunday or whenever you're hearing this and not let it do a single thing in us. The choice is ours. I've heard it said before, it's impossible to disciple consumers. It's impossible to help people be more like Jesus if they're only interested in taking. People have called this type of person a spiritual vampire. I mean, Halloween's coming soon. Maybe you could go as a spiritual vampire. <laughs> Sounds like an awful thing, right? But there are people who want to be fed all the time without ever giving out. That's because consumption doesn't create heart transformation. Consumption doesn't create heart transformation. It's, it's like this. A person doesn't become an incredible athlete by eating a ton. But... An athlete often has to eat a ton to be a good athlete. Why? It's because they're burning what they take in. They're putting it to work. They're putting it to use. 
God is calling you to be transformed, which means we have to use it. We have to let it in and let it rattle around inside of us. We have to let the love and grace and kindness God offers us through Jesus to open our eyes to the good he has for us. I'm not trying to, to get you to go and do a bunch of good things for people just because you think that's a good idea. I'm also not trying to stop you from doing those good things. I'm trying to get at something deeper than that. What I want for you is, and for myself and for all of us is to experience the transformation that Jesus offers, the kind of transformation that opens your eyes to the ways you can represent Jesus to those around you by first experiencing Jesus yourself. And you end, up doing, you end up just doing it because your heart compels you to, to help others because your heart compels you because Jesus is working inside of you. This is how you can do that literally this week. You can represent Jesus well this week. Maybe you don't feel like you know who the least of these are. Here's how you can tell. It's anyone who you don't expect to repay your kindness, whether it's because they don't have the means to or because they just don't seem like the person who's going to do it. Pick one person to really focus on this week. Give like you've been given to. Put that unconditional love that Jesus offers you to work this week. Don't just consume it. The process of choosing to do that, in that process, Jesus will actually use that to continue transforming you. And there might just come a day when Jesus says to you, how you treated that person, that's how you're treating me. Loki was right. Besides God, no one is truly good or bad. If anything, we're, we tend to be bent toward evil, selfish actions without God's help. But here's what separates the sheep from the goats, the disciples of Jesus from others. The disciple of Jesus has allowed Jesus to get to work in him or her. The disciple of Jesus has taken in Jesus' love and grace and allowed him to set them on a path toward life and heart and mind transformation of becoming more and more like Jesus in the way that they live. We may never be truly good like God is, but God is working us in the direction, in that direction, if we open ourselves up to it. You can experience that kind of life and eternity. You can do it by inviting Jesus into your life to transform you. And if you've done that, you can be reminded that this is a lifelong process of transformation. It's not just a one-time ticket punch. And then, a huge part of that transformation has everything to do with us having eyes to see those who are in need and being the hands and feet of Jesus to meet those needs, whether they're physical, emotional, or spiritual, typically they should all go together. If you want that for yourself, if you want to live that kind of life where Jesus is inside of you, he's transforming you, and he's opening your eyes to those things around you, would you pray with me? Dear God, thank you that you work in us in such powerful ways, that it's more than just a prayer and that there's no way that we can ever earn it. It's literally us being willing to allow you to change us and transform us from the inside out. So today, God, for anybody who has never asked you to say or to be inside of us, we say, God, fill me. Forgive me for trying to do this on my own. I want to follow you with my life. Transform me into a person who is more and more like you, Jesus. And for those of us who have already said that and started that process in our lives, we ask that you'd help remind us that it never stops, that it's a lifelong opportunity for us to grow closer to you and be made more and more like you. And finally, God, open our eyes. Help us to see the needs around us, whether it's spiritual or physical or emotional, or all of those wrapped up into one, and help us to meet those needs and to be your hands and feet. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My favorite Sundays at RCC are the ones when I'm not teaching. That's because I love getting the opportunity to listen to the other pastors teach, and I especially love singing with our fantastic worship teams. Today, we conclude this service with a worship offering. Giving here at RCC is worship of God because God instructs us to give in Scripture. This is what he says in the Bible. It's in the book of Malachi. It's chapter 3, verse 10. 
He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord Almighty, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Let me prove it to you. Here's how Janet and I have done that. First, we simply figure out how much we make each week. Then, we move the decimal over one spot to the left, and that's 10%. We went to the Rebel Give link at rccsunday.com and clicked on the reoccurring gift option, and voila, we tithe to God at RCC every week from our income. We do that online now, but we began tithing almost 30 years ago after we were taught about it at another great church that we were attending. It's Calvary Bible Church. That was a big step of faith to begin back then. It really was. But it's still a big step of faith for me today. But I believe God has and continues to bless us tremendously, just as he promises he was, this, just as he promises he will in the book of Malachi. So if you're ready for that, you can do that too each week with a reoccurring gift. Or you can choose to give a one-time gift using that same link. I know that obeying God in this way is difficult. And if you're not there yet, that's okay. Don't ever feel pressured to take any steps here at RCC that you're not ready for yet. I'm just happy that you chose to be here and that you're growing in your faith. Have a terrific week.